This week on MLS Insider. Matt is a guy that, under pressure situations, he knows how to handle himself. At that point, I helped my uh, brother-in-law, Donnie, up and handed him my son. And uh, I said, I'm, I'm going back to help your father. I think for me, certainly, there's been some like questionable things that people can run with and make assumptions, you know? Matt is a guy that, under pressure situations, he knows how to handle himself, and that's why you know that at, at that key moment, Matt will make the save that keeps you in the match. Here's another look. Good ball. Heidemann mishits it. Hit him! What a great save by Reese off of the Marshall effort. There's a lot of pressure on you to be perfect when called upon. And you might go through large stretches of the game where you don't see the ball at all, but then, you know, at that moment, you're called upon to make that big save. And you have to be perfect in those situations. Save by Reese. He comes up huge again. On the morning of the race, we were all very excited. Nicole left with her running partner, and then we were going to follow up with all the kids and meet them at mile 13. We took the whole family a little past the halfway point to see them and to cheer them on and hugs and kisses and take some pictures, and we went into the city to, uh, to see them at the finish line. We were at the finish line, and I had Jacob, our grandson, who was six at the time, standing in front of me and he couldn't see over the snow fencing. So Matt put Jacob on his shoulders and decided to go to a different location where Jacob would be able to see Nicole come down the finish line a little better. There was suddenly this huge explosion that blew us to the ground. I had been standing in front of John it suddenly blew me behind him and on top of him and over to our right. Um, and I really didn't know what had happened. John said, oh God, and um, oh my leg, Karen, my leg. And I'm thinking, well, I'm okay. But he was saying my leg and I said, oh, you'll be fine, John, you'll be fine. And I was sitting up by that point and I looked down at John's leg and I knew we were in serious trouble. The first bomb went off. Uh, it was probably about 30 feet uh, away from me. And uh, my brother-in-law, Donnie, was standing right next to me, and it knocked him uh, to the ground along with a lot of the other people around. Uh, somehow, I was still standing, and I had my son still on my shoulders. At that point, I helped my uh, brother-in-law, Donnie, up and handed him my son. And uh, I said, I'm, I'm going back to help your father. His pants were blown apart on the left side, and the muscle was sticking out of his leg. And um, so I took a pair of uh, pants that I had brought for Nicole to change into, uh, running pants. And I tied it around his leg as best I could to try and stop the bleeding. But it wasn't doing anything. And next thing I knew, within seconds, Matt was standing over my shoulder. John was on the ground and he was moaning that his, his leg hurt and there was a lot of blood that was on the ground and uh, I knew that it was, you know, just coming from him and, you know, I knew that, uh, you know, it was, it was a very dire situation that we were in and at that point Karen said we need a tourniquet 
and uh, I took my belt off and, and wrapped it around and, and tried to get it as tight as I could and took my jacket off and tried to apply as much pressure to the wound as I, I possibly could. His color had changed. He was starting to doze. He said, oh, I just want to go to sleep. And we were all telling him, no, John, you've got to stay awake. I was just talking to him, telling him we were going to get through it and telling him to, to stay with me and, and to squeeze my hand, and he was doing that. Then our older son, Donnie, arrived, and he went to find medical treatment. And they got him in the ambulance, and my son was saying, go, go. There was a point, uh, you know, when I got my son that uh, I broke down and uh, just told him that we needed to, to stay strong for Grampy. And uh, it's tough with a, you know, with a little seven-year-old and uh, trying to make sure that, that he didn't think the worst and that, that he tried to stay strong. And I, I just said, now let's, let's say a prayer. Let's, let's make sure we give Grampy all the strength that he needs to get through this. Karen went through and told me exactly what had happened uh, and, and what took place. So it was pretty emotional time uh, when uh, Matt came in. All I wanted to do with, uh, was hug him and kiss him and thank him because uh, He's the one that saved my life. It wasn't for him to do that quick, thinking about putting that belt on him, pulling that thing that tight, um, I might have died right there. Lead with the outside of your ankle bone. Okay. Keep those toes pointed at me. Yep, good. John's progress is nothing short of miraculous. From them telling me he may never walk again, in fact, telling me that he may lose his leg in the future, to walking. He just continues to exceed all expectation. What he's been through is, is terrible, but you know, what he does on a day-to-day -day basis is, is amazing. And you know, it's funny to hear him say a lot of people come up to him and, and want to shake his hand just because of, of what he's doing. And, and you know, he doesn't see it, but he is an inspiration to a lot of people. So I had uh, Odom number one put on uh, one of my warm-up shirts, and uh, you know I wear that uh, on the bench and, and before the games, just to, to show them that I'm thinking of them, and it gives me strength, to be honest. To be out here tonight amongst everybody, watch this game, it's something I never thought I'd be able to do again. It's just it's really hard to explain what that, that feeling is. Matt felt very uncomfortable being called a hero. He believes that anyone would have done that. Ugh. But like I told him, I said, but you weren't anyone. You were Matt that did it. Look at, look at mine. This is the jersey swap. Yeah. That would have been great. <laughs> to be able to, to help save a man's life is, is pretty amazing especially the, uh, you know, the father of your wife. I've said it to myself, but I've never really said it to anybody else, but it's, you know, the best save I've ever made. Coming up on MLS Insider. I was kind of like everybody else. I kind of had a, a pretty serious opinion about Steven Lenhart, you know, watching him on the field and thought, you know, what's, what's this guy all about?
I think for me, certainly, there's been um, some like questionable things that are like that people can run with and make assumptions. You know, people who who view or watch soccer games or write about me or whatever is going on. I, I generally know that that they don't have a full view of, of who I am, and it's okay. I kind of just like do my own thing outside of it, and that's it's good for me. It's interesting, uh, the perceptions people have, but you can't do anything about that. I was kind of like everybody else. I kind of had a, a pretty serious opinion about Steven Lenhart, you know? Watched him on the field and thought, you know, what's, what's this guy all about? Dude, these are ridiculous. What are you feeding these things? Steroids. <laughs> what were you gonna show me? Oh, buddy. So you just like this in the woods, and this is how you sleep? Yeah. I got to see how you do it, man. You've got to be kidding me. And you just chill out yeah. in nature. Yeah, that's it. Just waiting for a bear to come get you. It's actually pretty comfy. This is where it all started, on the open road. Lenny, Lenny was avoiding me for about a good month, I'd say, when I got to the team. Because he, when he, when no, he got no, here. No, no, no. Yeah, I'll tell it straight. Because he, he considered me competition, so he was gonna, he was giving me the strong arm. He wasn't gonna talk to me. The only competition that we had going on was your hair versus my hair. <laughs> we never had anything else. I think they're a little bit misunderstood on the field. Um, then off the field, they're, they're, they're completely different. Lenny's just a jokester, he's smiling all the time, and, and Gordo's the same way, he's a laid back guy. He's, he's got a very easy going way about him, he's a, he's a beach guy. You know, he, uh, he lives to be by the ocean. It's interesting, you, you'd think, you know, guys competing for a spot, it, it wouldn't be the right formula to, to be best friends. You know, initially you'd think, you know, there may be some hard feelings, but there's not. They have a great relationship, you know, and I think it's, it's kind of a, a privilege for one to get subbed on for one another. They just have a, a real determination that they're there to win. And that's not just in games, that's in practice every day. It's unlike any competition that I've had on any other team with other forwards um, competing with Gordo because we are such good friends and it is something that we have a good understanding on where we, we trust each other and we know that whoever's on the field is for the team. Sometimes when Lenny puts in a full shift, you know, and I know like the energy and, and you know, he's bleeding and he's put in a lot of hard work. And then I come on and kind of just in the right place at the right time, kind of feel bad. I want to give him those goals. You know, it's kind of the relationship we have, right? They're always approachable, you know, but they're, they're very fiery competitors. And when those guys step on the field, it's, it's business. Give, 
you know, everything we have to the team. And sometimes it comes off, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But at the end of the day, we can go home and say, you know, we gave everything we had. And that's all we care about. First base, sixth position in the 65th minute. Now entering the match, number 14, Adam John. For number 16, Stephen Lenhart. You know, there's, there's always that intensity in, in sports, you know, and I think the, the real credit to both of them is that they can make that separation, as, as all professionals should. Soccer is not my life. I, there's other things that I enjoy, that I find life in, and those are very important to me. And that's kind of the point. We want to live our lives, you know. We want to experience life. You know, we, we give everything when we're at practice and soccer and games, but we leave it there, and then we come and enjoy life. Coming up on MLS Insider. Welcome to MLS Storytime Theater. I'm the world champion, Judah Friedlander. Today's story is called Cheatin' Bob and the Great Switcheroo. Welcome to MLS Storytime Theater. I'm the world champion, Judah Friedlander. Today's story is called Cheatin' Bob and the Great Switcheroo. Soccer, it is said, provides many life lessons. There's no substitute for hard work and dedication. Discipline and teamwork make winners. If you can exploit a weird loophole in the rules and profit from it, good for you. Back in July of 2003, on a steamy hot day at RFK Stadium, the Metro Stars and DC United were tied after 90 minutes. In those days, they played overtime in MLS. Ties were un-American. Now, both teams had already used up their maximum of three field player substitutions, but the Metro's coach, Bob Bradley, was desperate to get a fresh pair of legs onto the pitch. So Bob reached into his bag of tricks and remembered a now defunct MLS loophole, which was basically that even after using up all three of your field player substitutions, you could still substitute the goalie. So Bradley, before overtime started, designated midfielder Mark Lisi as a goalie and substituted him with Eddie Gavin as the new goalkeeper, even though Gavin was just a midfielder, and he reassigned Tim Howard as the midfielder, who's actually the goalie. Confused? So was everyone. So they've made a temporary goalkeeper substitution. I hate this rule, yeah. by the way. I, I think this is just subverting. Yeah. It's just cheating. But it, it's in there, and that's what it is. So Tim Howard put on a field player's jersey over his goalkeeper jersey and played midfield for about 10 seconds. And in goal was scared 16-year-old non-goalie, youngest player in MLS history at the time, Freddie Adu before he was Freddie Adu, Eddie Gavin. So the ball goes out of bounds. Then Gavin and Howard take off their top shirts, still have their other shirts on. Howard goes back into goal. Gavin goes to midfield. The great switcheroo has occurred. With Howard back in goal and Eddie Gavin with energy to burn, even Coach Bradley could not have dreamt what would happen next. Far post, Pecky. Ivana, what a save by Howard! Good gracious! And here's a break for the Metro Stars. Eddie Gavin, the teenager, onside! Slides it, he scores! Eddie Gavin, an improbable goal and win for the Metro Stars! The great switcheroo earned Bradley the nickname Cheatin' Bob, at least among the very upset DC United supporters. But technically, it was legal. And for me, it earns him two thumbs up for brains and three cojones for courage. I'm the world champion, Judah Friedlander. Join me again next time for MLS Storytime Theater. Coming up on MLS Insider.
Cross all the way to the back post, knocked down on the doorstep, and Chicago have the opening goal of the game. A big shot there. On the next MLS Insider. They love us here. We could hear the fans yelling at us and stuff in the locker room, and then when you get out on the field, it's really close. But we had some business in our mind, and so we pushed out all the fans, and then we, I think, actually turned it into a positive thing.